I feel a little bit like I'm carrying coals to Newcastle because there are people here with really amazing expertise in the radiosurgical management of patients with pituitary adenomas, uh, greater than mine, I dare say, but uh, I'll do my best. So people have trouble adapting to technical changes, disruptive changes. Even to some time, to some extent, radiation oncologists will uh, have a hard time accepting the concept of low volume, high dose radiation, which is how they think of radiosurgery. But it, it's more of an issue on the neurosurgical side because neurosurgery is often organized in a paramilitary way and we're going off to war and we beat our chests when things go well with surgery. But the fact is, if there's a better way of winning the battle, we should embrace it. And radiosurgery often is that. And this is not a repeat of a vestibular schwannoma talk. I just want to bring this up to show how the, these battles can take on a life of their own and harden along lines. Uh, this was a paper from Norway in neurosurgery a couple of years ago about vestibular schwannoma radiosurgery. It purported to show that uh, radiosurgery was better in a prospective randomized trial than, than microsurgery and unusual for neurosurgery, which usually has several comments after the papers. They had seven. And guess what? Uh, the four radio surgeons all said, well, great, this shows that radiosurgery works. And the three microsurgeons all said, well, that just shows they didn't know how to operate. Uh, so that, that's the kind of controversy that exists in vestibular schwannoma radiosurgery. And Dr. Friedman touched on that uh, earlier. And fortunately, for pituitary adenoma management, I, I don't think that's really the case because there's a general consensus that surgery is the best treatment for patients who have symptomatic macroadenomas and who have hypersecreting tumors that are symptomatic not because of their size but because of the substance that they, that they produce. So the goals of management of these patients are to completely remove the tumors for oncologic cure, that is to prevent them from growing, that could be surgery or radiosurgery, uh, and or to achieve endocrine remission because hypersecreting tumors can be macroadenomas uh, as well. Uh, there's also a consensus that for patients with prolactinomas uh, that are either large uh, and or have a prolactin level of greater than 500 nanograms per milliliter, that the treatment of choice is medical management with a dopamine agonist. And that basically works all the time for those patients. So this is an algorithm uh, uh, that originally came out of the work from the Stanford uh, endocrine group led by Larry Katz Nelson, who's a neurosurgeon. And you could see uh, it happens to be about incidentally found tumors, but this is a useful way of stratifying treatment for pituitary tumor patients in general. If you have a functioning tumor, that is a hypersecreting tumor, it's, if it's a prolactinoma, very high prolactin level, or a macroadenoma, older person, undoubtedly you treat those patients with dopamine agonists. The exception to that would be a young woman of childbearing age in whom the prolactinoma is interfering with conception, in whom, well, there there might be some dispute. I think most neurosurgeons would definitely think that surgery is the best option. There are some endocrinologists who'd prefer to try to manage those patients medically. That's still probably a minority uh, of those physicians. Whereas if the patients have Cushing's disease, or acromegaly, uh, pretty much no question. Everyone agrees you should aim for a surgical cure, whether it's incidentally found or not. For a non-functioning tumor, uh, if it's a small tumor, no question the patient should be followed. The tumors may never grow to a symptomatic size. If they are symptomatic, from visual loss would be probably the most common symptom, especially a visual field loss, to the classic uh, paradigm would be a bitemporal hemianopsia from chiasmal compression, although not exclusively that. They can have extraocular movement deficiencies because of involvement of the cranial nerves of the, uh, of the cavernous sinus. And those patients should be managed almost definitely starting with surgery. And we'll see what role radiosurgery has to play uh, in those patients. Uh, if the macroadenoma is large enough to be compressing the chiasm but is asymptomatic, then also some debate and difference between physicians about whether you would 
uh, take those patients for surgery at that point or follow them, but, but that's sort of a dealer's choice that we don't have to dwell on too much here. So transfenoidal surgery is the mainstay of management of patients with pituitary adenomas. This is a classic example of somebody with a non-functioning large macroadenoma causing visual loss, and th these are preoperative images obtained in the R with intraoperative MRI. That happens to be something I'm interested in, so I'll so a few, show a few examples of that. Uh, here's the ENT surgeon preparing the nose uh, on the left, and you could see a better view of the magnet under the table there. Uh, and on the lower right, though, these are images taking what's called the compare function off the intraoperative MRI, pre-op, intra-op, where I thought that the tumor was basically all out, which is a little embarrassing because it looks like it was barely touched. And then I found a few septations behind which the majority of the tumor still lay, and that's without and with contrast, and you could see the tumor is out, and you get a surgical cure that way. No one would really think of using radiation therapy or radiosurgery in a patient like that. I'm only showing this particular case because the previous surgery was done microsurgically, and this was uh, done endoscopically, and I just did it two days ago, so it's sort of hot off the press, but uh, anyway, very nice. And, and it's fun surgery, especially nowadays with the endoscope, you get a uh, nice view of the cella. If the tumor is large enough uh, and the diaphragm cell is disrupted, you can see up to the optic chiasm uh, before and after a section with intraoperative MRI. And there are various techniques for repairing the CSF leak using a fluorescein injection through a, a spinal catheter and then confirming that there's no leak at the end. Different grafting materials, fat graft, and that's how the surgery goes. So again, there's a consensus across the board that if you can cure patients with these tumors surgically, that's, that's what you should do. So what is the role of radiosurgery? It is primarily is an adjuvant treatment for patients with tu pituitary tumors, especially those who have incompletely resected non-functioning adenomas and whom the, the goal is to stop tumor growth. It doesn't matter if the tumor is still there as long as it's not growing and not compressing the optic chiasm. Uh, or if you have an incompletely resected or endocrine persistent hypersecreting tumor where the goal is very different because the tumor may not grow, but if it's still producing your excess ACTH or growth hormone, uh, then the patient's life is at risk from that. And there you really have to achieve an endocrine remission. So in, in a sense, it's analogous to AVM radiosurgery. Uh, let's assume you have to really obliterate in AVM and not just subtotally obliterate it. You know, it's in a way all or none, and that, that's the same thing with hypersecreting uh, pituitary tumors, uh, at least those causing uh, Cushing's disease and uh, acromegaly. You, you, it, it's sort of all or none. For an occasional patient, and I'll show an example of that later on, who uh, has a tumor with a primary cavernous sinus component, it can, it can, then radiosurgery can be the primary tumor primary treatment modality for a patient with a pituitary tumor, uh, that would be relatively uh, unusual. So here's a hoary chestnut from the radio surgery literature. Almost all pituitary tumors are benign, so if you subscribe to the linear quadratic formula of radiation therapy, and I'm heading out on maybe some thin ice here with Dr. Schlesinger is in the office, in the audience, I don't want to uh, misspeak in terms of physics, but uh, from a primitive neurosurgeon's understanding of the formula and these curves, the more benign a tumor or late responding or slow growing or to put it in the formulas terms, lower alpha beta ratio, the bigger bang you get for your radiosurgical buck. So if you're going to give 15 gray to a early responding tumor or one with a higher alpha beta ratio, the equivalent dose in fractionated uh, radiation terms is okay, but it's not as high. Much, much better if you're treating a benign tumor. So single dose radiosurgery uh, really favors the treatment of benign tumors, which uh, basically all pituitary tumors are, uh, practically speaking. So what would be the criteria for treating a pituitary tumor patient with radiosurgery? Surgical treatment should be maximized. Uh, if the whole tumor is out, then that's it. You don't have to do anything else uh, as long as they also have achieved endocrine uh, remission. 
If it's not, then perhaps sometimes the patient should be followed and reoperated on when the time comes. So surgical treatment should be maximized. Medical treatment should be maximized. If they have a prolactinoma or if they have growth hormone secreting tumor that is not ideal for surgery, then they should be treated medically. But if you're going to do radiosurgery, you should stop the medical treatment in advance of the radiosurgery, probably for about eight weeks, because analogous to surgery, your, your remission rates are better if you stop your medical treatment enough in advance of the surgery to maximize the surgical results. And there's a literature that shows that that's true as well for radiosurgery, both for patients with prolactinomas and uh, growth hormone secreting tumors. You have to keep your maximum dose to the optic chiasm less than 8 gray. There is a small literature that shows you can go up to 10 or even 12 gray, but one of the, mission, one of the goals we were charged with was to talk about indications and complications. So I would tell you to, if you're going to exceed that 8 gray threshold for, for pituitary tumors for the chiasmal dose, you should do it with real caution. And it's really best if you stick to that 8 gray maximum. Practically speaking, that generally means that your tumor margin should be at least three millimeters from the optic chiasm. So uh, you could also treat patients with hypersecreting microadenomas in whom surgical risks are high uh, if the tumor is small enough and otherwise favorable for radiosurgery because, they, again, they have a lethal disease, Cushing's disease or uh, acromegaly. You also want to make sure that after your surgical treatment is maximized that enough time has <coughs> elapsed. You would never treat these patients early on after surgery because things change a lot if you wait a little bit after surgery. Here's an example from a, a paper we published in a, uh, 1999. Here's what the tumor looked like originally after surgery. It almost looks like a peak and shriek operation, but believe in yourself, wait three months, and that's what it looks like. Now you have a radiosurgical target. So the decrease in volume of residual tumor and stuff after transfernoidal surgery is measurable, predictable, and it could be quite dramatic. So you should wait at least three months for radiosurgery after surgery. Make sure your imaging is as good as possible. Uh, potentially try to plan off of a three Tesla magnet where you'll see things with somewhat more clarity than with a 1.5. Now, you could do pituitary radiosurgery with any available device, and basically it'll work if you do it carefully, you plan the treatment properly, and you make sure that it's delivered accurately. Uh, this was a patient treated when I was at New Jersey Medical School using a great system. This was a marriage of the X-Knife, the late lamented X-Knife made by uh, the company formerly known as Radionics. Uh, what's that? But, no, no, well, but, well, hold on a second, <laughs> joined to the University of Florida floor stand. <laughs> that was a, a partnership between radionics and UF that lasted about three weeks, I think. <laughs> uh, but it was great while it lasted. So here's a it's patient. Like was that? <laughs> Talking about heading out to thin ice. Let's, uh, um, here's a patient with a recurrent non-functioning adenoma. She had had prior transfernoidal surgery. In, Radiation ther therapy, tumor regrew by temporal hemianopsia. This is what it looked like after her surgery and tumor control five years later after radiosurgery. You could do it with a cyber knife, uh, even though Accurate decided not to support this meeting at all. I, I, I guess no reason to change the slides. This was somebody who actually never had surgery. Um, she was followed for a small tumor. That looked like a pituitary adenoma uh, originating in the right cavernous sinus in enlarged. Uh, she had ophthalmoplegia, especially cranial nerve 6, and numbness on the right face, and uh, uh, was treated with CyberKnife at Overlook Hospital. Uh, these are pictures at the time. The only way I could capture images was to photograph the screen. But anyway, you could see uh, the treatment plan. Uh, and we did indeed treat her with two fractions, and I'll talk about that at, at the end of the talk. As you can see here, nine gray uh, times two, uh, with shrinkage of the tumor and symptomatic improvement uh, half a year later. Uh, you could certainly use the cyber knife in an adjuvant setting. This is a patient with a large non-functioning adenoma who had intraoperative MRI-guided surgery. As you can see, with 
looks like it's hard to tell what that residual is, uh, but there was some residual tumor there. Uh, he received 14 grain a single fraction and has remained controlled since then. You could treat the patients with a Novalis MMLC, inverse planning uh, type system. This patient had had two prior transvenoidal operations elsewhere and radiation therapy. Uh, the Novalis system, as you either know or you'll see, is a, a LINAC based system with a robotic couch that positions the patients with a combination of stereotactic coordinates, infrared optical tracking, and registration between fluoroscopy and, uh, and preoperative digital imaging. Uh, that's what the, what the treatment plan looked like. In her case, the prescription dose was 12 gray, and as I'll allude to later on, this is one of the things that you have to take into account prior radiation. So you can't have some simple fixed abstract notion of what the dose is besides volume, location, uh, and other potential morbidities. Uh, it's that. It, it's prior radiation as well. So this is how she did overall. This is what her M MRI looked like when she presented with apoplexy, a not very impressive looking operation there. Uh, okay, but just wait, wait, see. Now, after three months, you have your radio surgery target. We're over four millimeters away from the optic chiasm, and uh, she remains controlled after having failed all of her previous treatments. And you can also treat the patients uh, with a gamma knife. Uh, this patient had a very partial previous transvenoidal resection of his tumor, which continued to enlarge, and he was symptomatic. After his repeat operation, waiting a few months, that's what the residual tumor plus gland looked like. It's a picture of uh, our new gamma knife, which we installed at the um, initiative of uh, my radiation oncology colleague, John Nisley, a uh, little different from most situations where the neurosurgeons are pushing for it, but nonetheless, we're, uh, we're doing great and, and happy to be working with this. And we were able to treat this patient with 16 gray and keep the 8 gray line below the optic chiasm. <clears throat> so if you look at the literature on the treatment of patients with non-functioning adenomas, uh, this is from a chapter in textbook of stereotactic and functional neurosurgery surgery from a few years ago. You could see that, unsurprisingly, for these small volume benign tumors, that the tumor control rate uh, is quite high, uh, on the order of 95 percent or even more, if you sort of add up all the series. This is not true for patients with hypersecreting tumors. The rate of endocrine remission is just not that high. This is from Dr. Steiner's chapter um, in, the same, in, the, in the same book, and there certainly are many other reports that look at this in the reviews, and the rates of remission really remain kind of the same over multiple series, even with, as you'd expect, much higher doses uh, than you would use to, to prevent a non-functioning tumor from growing. Uh, and as you can see, the remission, remission rate, especially for prolactinoma patients, is, uh, uh, is quite low. So that's why no one, I think, would really suggest that radiosurgery is the primary treatment for patients with hypersecreting tumors. It should be reserved for patients who failed uh, other treatments. And the question is how to make this better, Do whether it's dose escalation or uh, some combination of me medical treatment and radiosurgery. So uh, residents? What does this patient have? Hirsutism, gaining weight, diabetes mellitus, abdominal striae, easy bruising, poor healing of, of wounds. What has she got? What's that? Cushing. Cushing's disease. This lady has had thickening of her facial features, enlargement of her hands, had to take off her wedding ring, her voice has gotten deeper. Yeah, very good. Okay. Uh, what about complications of pituitary radiosurgery? Um, whether hypopituitarism is really something you'd call a complication, I don't know. Because if you're treating this small area in which you can almost never differentiate the tumor from the gland on imaging, to say that getting a decrease in pituitary function is a complication, it's almost part of the treatment itself. Nonetheless, it's not inevitable. It is dose dependent, so in that sense, we have an ability to lower that rate of complication. 
And it's as high as 72%. That was uh, incidents uh, at the series at the Karolinska Institute, the, the home uh, of the gamma knife. Uh, certainly, in general, you can assume it's going to be on the order of 30%. So about one-third of the patients whom you treat with pituitary, pituitary SRS will get hypopituitarism over uh, several years. Now, what about visual loss? This will be, should be a very rare, bad, but very rare complication if you keep your maximum chiasmal dose to less than 8 gray. But keep in mind, any prior treatments that the patients have had, well, obviously with radiosurgery, but also certainly with radiation therapy, no matter how, how far back in the past. And future neurosurgeons, don't think that you can simply shove this off and let the radiation oncologists and physicists worry about it. If you're doing radiosurgery, you're responsible, and you have to make sure that that treatment plan meets these criteria and, and that the patients are appropriately treated. And then the secondary neoplasia, uh, I'll, it was alluded to earlier, I'll just say a, a brief word about it in a bit. So what about dose selection? There's not a, much hard data to really guide one on this. It's, it's based on the notion that, well, benign slow-growing tumors can be treated with a lower dose, but hypersecreting tumors where you have to obliterate and not just stop, need a higher dose. So for non-functioning tumors, the rates that have been described range between 13 and 16 gray. The bigger the tumor, the closer you are to the chiasm, prior treatments, uh, you choose a lower dose, and, and the converse presumably is true. For hypersecreting tumors, the, the prescription dose can be as high as 30 gray. Again, keeping within those chiasmal uh, constraints. The cavernous sinus, which primarily contains motor efferent nerves, there's an afferent component to the trigeminal nerve, but it's not a special afferent nerve, so for whatever reason. Uh, uh, and it's also a peripheral nerve, not like the, the optic nerves, which are central nervous system uh, uh, histologically. Uh, the cavernous sinus can take a bigger hit. You can certainly give over 20 gray and even potentially as high as 40 gray into the cavernous sinus and not see a complication. You don't want to push it too much. What might make this better in the future? This is an idea uh, uh, promoted by Brain Lab, the idea that intraoperatively as you're doing surgery, this happens to be for a meningioma, but it could be for anything else including a pituitary tumor, that based on your updated navigation, you'll create a model of the tumor. You could do with intraoperative imaging as well. Do your radiosurgical treatment planning on the fly and say, okay, it, we still can't do a safe treatment plan, too much dose in the brain stem, or all right, uh, down here, this is small enough. We can treat with, with SRS or fractionated SRS or RT, whatever the case may be. So that, that could be one way that neurosurgeons can, can maximize their, their role or the bank for their buck in pituitary radiosurgery. So what about neoplasia? Dr. Freeman quoted the paper by Patel and Chang, uh, and they estimated 1 in 2,500 risk. Now, I mentioned this from the chapter by Dr. Steiner, 0.7 percent, 1 out of 140 patients. That seems awfully high, and I don't think that jibes with the experience of, of anyone in this room or elsewhere in the literature, but it's worth including just as a caution to know that there is going to be some risk. Radiation therapy has a risk of secondary neoplasia. It stands to reason that radiosurgery is going to do it at a much lower rate, but still it's going to be something. And it's true that the group in Sheffield, England, uh, headed by Jeremy Rowe, did find 0% secondary neoplasia in 1,200 patients followed for 10 years. But a couple of years after that uh, paper came out, they did report a case of a probable vestibular schwannoma malignant transformation. So it's rare, but not zero. A few brief words about frame versus framelessness. Are frames the gold standard? A famous picture by John Adler showing a bent pin in a CRW frame. Bob Misunis, uh, I think we can agree, he's late and lamented, showed how there's potential inaccuracies in uh, in stereotactic frames. There were studies showing the accuracy of frameless systems. We compared patient perceptions of frame versus frameless for people with benign and malignant disease, and frame, framedness married, mattered more to them in a perception of discomfort and pain in radiosurgery than malignant versus benign disease. So why does that matter? Because what's the role of hypofractionation for pituitary radiosurgery? This is a paper by John Adler using 
a cyber knife, and the histologies are mixed. Uh, fewer than half of the patients had pituitary tumors, but nonetheless, the same principles presumably uh, apply. Uh, patients were treated with an empiric, empirically selected uh, mix of sessions and doses and so on, and you could see a high rate of tumor control, and only one of those patients had visual loss because of the radiation as opposed to tumor growth. So it, it's not great, obviously, for that patient, but overall, not bad statistics. So these are patients all of whose tumors were within two millimeters of the optic chiasm. So is there a role for fractionated radiosurgery? Maybe we'll hear uh, something about that from uh, Dr. DeSalis uh, when he speaks. So in sum, radiosurgery provides excellent control of pituitary tumor growth, although keep in mind that endocrinological remission is less likely to occur. You have to protect the optic apparatus, keep the maximum dose to less than 8 gray. The role of hypofractionation uh, is uncertain, and that even after these many years of pituitary radiosurgery is still a subject for a future study. Thank you.